What's going on guys, this is Rob, and welcome to Where to Start, a weekly series where I give you a suggested reading list for various comic book characters and teams based on my experience, and this week we're going to be talking about Batman. So with the New 52, things are pretty straightforward actually. It's pretty easy to follow for the most part. Batman Zero Year is where you want to pick up. This is the quintessential origin, I guess, or not really quintessential, but this is the New 52 origin of Batman uh, with regards to how it is that Bruce Wayne steps into this role. Of course, we covered this with a video, so you're welcome to check that out if you want to. But again, this pretty much just gives us a synopsis of Bruce Wayne returning to Gotham as he's an adult and the conflict that he runs into when he's uh, going against the Red Hood gang. He's discovering this newer criminal element of Gotham City, but it also has to do a lot with the idea of the people around him, uh, Alfred Pennyworth, his Uncle Philip, for example, wanting him to step into the role of uh, Thomas Wayne and take over Wayne Enterprises. And so again, this is basically just going to tell you, this story is going to tell you how it is that Bruce Wayne goes from being this blunt instrument swathing away at uh, the criminal element in Gotham to becoming a more precision, uh, I guess, surgeon kind of scalpel with regards to his role in Batman. Now, after this comes the Court of Owls. Now, the Court of Owls was a stupendous important story for Batman, even if it's only part of the New 52. I would say this is one of the most important stories regarding Batman in the entire history of Batman comics. And the reason why I say this is because when you look at the Court of Owls and the Night of Owls, or I guess the Night of Owls being part of the whole Court of Owls thing, what this did is it gave us a different depiction of Batman. It told us that Batman has a breaking point. And this breaking point isn't necessarily Batman freaking out, getting upset, or attacking people. This is Batman's psychological breaking point. The fact that Batman can be broken, or at the very least, can be put in a, I guess, in a state of mind to where he begins to lose his sanity. And that's what happens in the Court of Owls. Over the course of this event, we also find that Batman doesn't know nearly as much about Gotham as he thought he did. And this, again, is very important because what it tells us here is that effectively, if Bruce Wayne is going to be operating as Batman and within the realm of Gotham City, he has to know everything about Gotham City. And the fact that there was a group called the Court of Owls, which had been functioning under the nose of Batman all this time for generations dating back hundreds of years and Batman never knew about it tells us that Batman doesn't know everything. The Batman still has a lot to learn here. Now, with regards to the older stories, which in truth are my favorite ones, I prefer these a lot, what we're going to do is we're going to jump back to 1987 with Frank Miller and uh, Dave Musichelli, I think it is, or Musichelli, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, but this is Batman Year One. Now, Batman Year One is considered the quintessential Batman origin story, even by today's standards. This is the origin story that people cite is saying the best origin story that was ever written for Batman. And there's a reason for this. Frank Miller is fantastic when it comes to writing these kind of dark, gritty sort of, uh, of, of concepts or dark, gritty sort of uh, stories. Now, from here, we jump to The Man Who Laughs. Now, The Man Who Laughs was published by Ed Brubaker and uh, Doug Mackney in 2005. Now, while this came long after Batman's, uh, Batman Year One, this was designed to be the, uh, I guess, the direct follow-up to Batman Year One. This is taking place directly after that. And where the killing joke gives us this kind of origin to a degree of the Joker, the man who laughs basically gives us the first confrontation between Batman and the Joker. It's a retelling of a lot of things that we had seen in the very early comics, that is to say, Batman issue number one and so on from way back in the uh, in the 30s. But nonetheless, this is a story that again simply just starts off this whole cavalcade, starts off this whole situation where uh, Batman and the Joker begin this, uh, this feud that will last for decades and decades. Now after this, we jump to 1988. And 1988 is Batman Death in the Family. Now, Death in the Family was a very, very big story when it happened. This was this was introduced to us by Jim Starlin and Jim Apero. Now, Death in the Family, the reason why it's so big is because this was the death of Jason Todd. Now, as far as I understand it, the way DC had done this, they didn't really know which road they wanted to take, if Jason Todd was going to live, if he was going to die, but he was going to vacate the role of Robin regardless of what road was taken. And so they opened it up to fans, and they allowed fans to decide. And by a margin of, I think, like 100 votes, uh, fans ultimately decided that Jason Todd would die. Now, with Jason Todd being killed off, this was Batman's breaking point in a lot of ways. Batman became darker. He became more gritty. He became more violent. It was simply an instance for us to see that Batman, despite his, uh, I guess, the walls, the barriers that he puts up around his emotions with regards to other people, that in the end, he still does care about these people to a great degree. Now, from here, we jump to the Nightfall story arc. Now, the Nightfall story arc is most infamous because of Bane breaking Batman's back. The fact that Batman had to vacate the role, or I guess Bruce 
Henry had to vacate the role of Batman for quite some time. And again, this is one of the really cool things here. One of the things that I think you guys will enjoy when it comes to the Nightfall story arc is the concept of Bane. Bane, as he was depicted in the uh, Christopher Nolan uh, Batman trilogy in The Dark Knight Rises, is not really accurate. At the end of the day, that Bane was still a henchman. He was still basically a guy working for Talia al Ghul. With regards to this version of, uh, of Bane in this story, this is the intelligent Bane. This is the educated Bane, the classical educated Bane. This is the Bane that figured out Batman's identity in three months, I think it was. This is what makes, uh, th this is one of the reasons why Bane became such a fan favorite is because he wasn't just some guy who was pumping, uh, pumping a toxin that enhanced his physique that made him absolutely massive. He was a guy who was a well-rounded, intelligent villain and was one of the most formidable foes that Batman had ever faced here. Now, the last one, and the one that I think is one of the more interesting ones here, is the Tower of Babel. Now, the Tower of Babel was given to us by Mark Wade in 2000, and the Tower of Babel, I think, was a huge deal. And the reason why was because what it showed us is that Batman can screw up just like anybody else. And in fact, it really presented this circumstance where Batman was kind of cast out from the Justice League as a pariah. And the reason why was because during the Tower of Babel, what Batman had been doing is he had basically been systematically going through and analyzing all the members of the Justice League, looking at their strengths, looking at their weaknesses, and trying to find a way to uh, effectively incapacitate them if something were to happen. If Superman were to lose his mind, how could he stop Superman if it was Wonder Woman, Aquaman, the Green Lantern, so on and so forth? This was a way for him to fix that, but the problem here was that Ra's al Ghul had come across this information and had stolen it and used it, to, uh, used it against the Justice League. And so again, this gives us another concept that Batman Batman isn't necessarily this character who is incapable of error, who may have some faults, but in the end always does the right thing. This gives us a really cool perspective that Batman screws stuff up, that Batman makes mistakes just like anybody else. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, let me know, and I will catch you guys later. Peace. Be sure to follow me on Twitter. There you can keep up with all the updates from Comics Explained and talk to me directly. Wow.